So it is a great pleasure today to have uh, Professor Yaroslav Kartasov to join us and uh, give a seminar on topological effects in polarity and condensates. This is a very hot topic in the last three, four years. Uh, Professor Kartasov, he's uh, working at the Institute of Photonics, uh, Photonic Sciences at the ICFO in uh, Spain, in Barcelona. And at the same time, the professor at the Institute of, uh, for Spectroscopy of Ross uh, Academy of Sciences. This is at Troitsk, uh, the most famous spectroscopic institute in, uh, in Russia, I would say. Um, and and uh, he's very well known uh, in nonlinear physics. His main research activities are on the physics of solitons, topological insulators, and uh, polaritonics. Uh, Professor Kardasov has published more than 300 uh, uh, papers I saw on the, on the Web of Science in peer-reviewed journals, and he's a member of uh, experts board of the Russian Academy of Sciences, to which he was elected uh, as a Russian Academy of Science professor. So, Professor Kardasov, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction and for invitation to give uh, a seminar in your group. So. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, many of your works and uh, they are really cool. So probably uh, uh, after this uh, talk, uh, I maybe will motivate some uh, interest to this uh, topological uh, physics in uh, polariton condensates, even though the system that uh, I consider here, uh, it usually involves some fabricated structures. So uh, uh, I was discussing with Sergey if uh, such material, if such structures are available uh, in uh, in uh, in your group. So, but uh, le le let's see. You, you you will tell me better. So uh, the results that I will be uh, describing here are obtained in collaboration with uh, Louis Turner from the Institute of Photonic Sciences, with uh, Professor Dmitry Skrebin from University of Bath and with two Chinese groups, which are led by Fang Weiye from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University and by uh, Yiche Zhang from uh, Xi'an Jiao Tong University. So just uh, let me uh, tell a couple of words about uh, topological insulators. So topological insulators are considered uh, sometimes as a new phase of matter. These are uh, materials with uh, uh, very unusual properties. They possess uh, forbidden topological gap in the bulk. So in the bulk, they behave like conventional insulators, but at the same time, they admit uh, topologically protected state at the edge of the material, uh, at the edge between topological insulator and topologically trivial material that are responsible and that can provide conductance. Uh, so typically such uh, edge states appear at the interface of materials which are characterized by different topological invariants. Usually this is Chern numbers. Uh, so uh, there exists very elegant theory that links uh, the number of edge states that appear at the given interface with uh, topological invariants. So basically it's just a difference of uh, topological uh, um, gap chair numbers for uh, two materials that are placed in contact. So, and this uh, gap chair number is just a sum of uh, chair numbers uh, for all bands uh, lying above uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, considered topological gap. Uh, so, initially, um, why these topological states are so interesting because in addition to the fact that they may provide conductance uh, they are topologically protected uh, the reason for topological protection is very simple so these edge states form in topological forbidden gap typically there is one state at one edge and other and other state uh, at other edge of the topological insulator. So if you introduce some disorder into structure in the form of, for example, missing pillar in the array of uh, microcavity pillars or 
some other defect like sharp bend of the surface, then uh, at a given this in perturbation uh, cannot lead to scattering of the edge state into other edge state with the same energy because there are no other edge states at the particular edge. So this state has to find the way uh, 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 around this defect and it will continue propagating along the same boundary. So I will I will show you the examples of this uh, kind of topological protection later. So this is the main uh, uh, interest, main uh, motivation of why people uh, investigate such edge states because uh, they promise numerous practical applications. For example, uh, one can imagine that topological insulators may be used as uh, uh, materials for uh, uh, information transfer uh, when the transfer process is not subjected to some losses due to disorder, due to inhomogeneities, and etc. Uh, in addition, you can realize, for example, topological laser on the basis of topological insulator. And this operation of this laser will be free from, uh, 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 it will not be affected by the defects of the underlying structure that usually lead to degradation of the uh, parameters of conventional lasers. So uh, initially, topological insulators were introduced in electronic systems, in solid state physics, and there are uh, these, uh, can you see the pointer? Yeah, so there are these two nice reviews that describe the properties of these uh, edge states. Of course, this is purely linear, uh, linear situation. Uh, and uh, over last uh, approximately last 10 years, considerable interest has emerged to a realization of topological insulators in uh, uh, of electromagnetic topological insulators. So this is the first proposal uh, for such insulators. Uh, the uh, Haldane, uh, very uh, famous guy now, suggested that they can be realized uh, in geromagnetic photonic crystals. Uh, and soon after that, uh, uh, experimental observation has uh, followed. Uh, and then uh, uh, there appear a number of papers uh, dealing with uh, topological insulators in very different systems, such as semiconductor quantum whales, arrays of couplet resonators, where one can introduce topological phase by engineering coupling between uh, different resonators. In metamaterials, this is the first observation, for example, at optical frequencies with helical waveguide array. And of course, this phenomenology uh, penetrated into the realm of uh, polariton microcavities. So there are many, many works, and I will describe briefly uh, some of them. Uh, so I let me uh, now turn to polaritons and microcavities. So I have to actually skip the slide when I uh, talk with professionals. <laughs> so uh, I only want to mention that uh, polaritons and microcavities uh, are especially interesting for topological physics because they possess very strong nonlinear interactions through their excitonic components. So this allows to investigate um, uh, very different uh, uh, nonlinear effects, uh, in particular formation of various types of solitons and uh, self-sustained excitations. This is like uh, dark solitons that appear in the flow past obstacles, in uh, in past defects, in the micro cavity, uh, different types of vortex states and vortex solitons, and even bright solitons if you excite. Uh, uh, the point uh, somewhere, uh, not not at the bottom of lower polariton branch, but somewhere where dispersion changes to time. In addition, uh, in uh, over last 10 years, there appeared very different uh, technologies uh, of potential energy landscape engineering in the microcavity. So there is a big review about uh, uh, these technologies. I just want to briefly mention, mention a couple of platforms. 
this is modulated microcavity wires, for example, that allow to observe one dimensional gap solitons. Uh, the modulation of potential energy landscape can be realized by surface acoustic waves propagating on the uh, surface of the microcavity. Uh, the trivial application of local strain also leads to realization of uh, localized potentials and uh, and this is the system that is most interesting for us. Uh, it's a uh, arrays of uh, cylindrical microcavities or etched microcavities uh, when uh, one forms the structure with the desired symmetry from individual micro pillars. In addition to this, uh, there are two more ingredients uh, that uh, allow to introduce uh, topology in uh, uh, polariton physics. Uh, polaritons enjoy from, uh, they may show spin orbit coupling due to, due to transverse electric transverse magnetic splitting for cavity photons, and they experience Zeeman splitting uh, in the external magnetic field. This is the property that is inherited from, uh, let's say, electronic nature of uh, uh, corresponding excitation. So it is namely the combination of these two effects that allows to uh, uh, observe uh, topological states in polariton microcavities. And in addition, they are strongly nonlinear. So they open very rich prospects for investigation of nonlinear effects in such systems. And this is actually main uh, main topic of my talk. Of course, investigation of nonlinear effects in uh, topological systems uh, are underway in other uh, physical uh, in other areas of physics, and in particular in nonlinear optics. So there are many works on. Uh, non-topological non-linear edge states and solitons in uh, uh, ribbons, in honeycomb ribbons of waveguides. And uh, there are many recent papers on non-linear edge states in Floke insulators. This is most promising platform uh, for realization of topological phases in non-linear optics. And there are very, two, uh, very recent two demonstrations uh, about uh, of uh, uh, topological solitons in the bulk of uh, topological insulators and at the edge. Uh, okay, so let me now uh, switch back to uh, polaritonic uh, systems and uh, describe, uh, let's say, most uh, interesting and um, uh, let's say, uh, a seminal result that we obtain it in this direction. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the very uh, phenomenology of uh, polyariton Z topological insulators, it was introduced in this paper by Anton Nalitov, uh, where they discovered that uh, in the array, in the honeycomb array, of uh, microcavity pillars, the application of external magnetic field and simultaneous action of spin orbit coupling leads to opening of the topological band in the uh, uh, dispersion uh, diagram uh, and uh, appearance of edge states connecting uh, different uh, bands in the spectrum. These edge states are localized at different sides of the array and this uh, picture illustrates what happens when you excite uh, one pillar in the center of the structure. This is non-topological regime and this is topological regime. So in non-topological regime, you just observe dispersion. Uh, of course, excitations concentrate uh, sooner or later reach uh, interfaces of the insulator and uh, they excite something which looks uh, intermediately localized. But uh, if you switch to topological regime, just by switching on magnetic field, when the excitation reaches the edge of the insulator, you excite two edge states, which surprisingly move in the opposite directions uh, across the border uh, of the topological insulator. So very similar effect can be demonstrated with uh, 
Wally Hall system in uh, polariton condensate. So the principle of uh, operation of this system is a little bit different. This system does not require any uh, external magnetic fields or spin orbit coupling. Uh, you just take uh, the interface of two honeycomb arrays uh, uh, and uh, two arrays uh, that create the interface just uh, has have to uh, have different uh, detunings of uh, sublattices A and B forming the array. At this interface, uh, edge states appear, which are called Wally Hall edge states. Uh, and uh, if you work in nonlinear regime, you can even construct dark vortex uh, in such systems. So this is a uni like a uniformly illuminated system with a vortex nested uh, uh, in condensate at the edge of the structure. And it turns out that this vortex will uh, circulate along the boundary and it will uh, along the interface. It is triangular in this case, and it will remain bound to this uh, interface. So very nice uh, uh, observation. So uh, there exist two, uh, to the best of my knowledge, two experimental works uh, about uh, topological effects in polariton uh, insulators. So first of them uh, uh, is positioned as uh, lasing, as a topological laser. Well, uh, lasing in Polariton condensate is uh, somehow synonymous to condensation. Uh, so basically what authors of this paper did, they took a uh, uh, sewer schiffer higer chain, uh, which is formed by uh, this uh, zigzag uh, array of uh, micro cavity pillars, and then they pumped in different uh, locations inside this array. So for example, when they pump uh, uh, in the bulk uh, of the structure, they observe uh, just excitation of some bulk modes. But if they pump at the edge, then they can excite uh, very well localized edge state, which can be shown to be of the topological origin. And uh, you can in principle see it in, uh, uh, in measured dispersion. Okay, so this system is essentially one dimensional, but there is also experiment about the truly two dimensional topological insulator, and it is reported in this uh, recent paper. So this is two dimensional array of micro cavity pillars with honeycomb structure uh, with uh, spin orbit coupling, uh, and it is subjected to external magnetic field. So the authors have shown that uh, in the topological gap, you can see the appearance of uh, uh, edge states with uh, opposite slopes for opposite uh, edges. Uh, and they have illustrated that, for example, if you excite, uh, uh, for example, the several pillars uh, at one edge of this structure, and you apply external magnetic field, the excitation starts to travel along the edge and it can even cross the corner of the structure. And what is interesting is that by changing the polarity of the uh, external, the, the, by changing direction of uh, external magnetic field, you can switch the direction uh, in which the excitation travels along the boundary. So this is typical illustration of unidirectional uh, edge states. Okay, so uh, I want to stress that uh, most of the experiments, uh, they are performed in somehow linear region, linear region. So for example, in this structure, there was a localized pulse at excitation, then it excited some, uh, uh, some edge state, and then it was allowed to travel, and it was uh, the, the, the density was of course, uh, uh, decreasing due to losses. So sooner or later, this uh, system uh, entered into linear region. Uh, what uh, we are interested in is uh, essentially nonlinear regime of uh, operation. And this uh, uh, brings me to the outline of this talk. So I would like to describe uh, 
uh, nonlinear effects, nonlinear edge state, and modulation instability and solitons in uh, honeycomb polariton uh, topological insulators. Then I will uh, uh, discuss how this physics changes if we change the lattice, if we move, for example, to leaf structures. Uh, so these two, these two works, they will be in idealized uh, conservative, uh, quasi-conservative regime without, uh, without losses. Uh, then I will switch to more realistic situations when you have losses in the system and coherent pump that allows you to actually selectively excite edge states at different uh, edges of the insulator. Uh, I will discuss how to realize topological polariton laser with incoherent pump. And then I will briefly discuss how one can achieve uh, switching between uh, edge states propagating at the opposite edges of the polariton topological insulator. So let me uh, now turn to a uh, theoretical model that we are using to describe the system. So we are interested in uh, topological insulator, which is based on the array of uh, honeycomb microcavity pillars. This array is assumed to be uniform, uh, infinite, let's say in y direction, but truncated in the x direction. So why do we need, uh, namely, honeycomb structure is because uh, it has uh, Dirac degeneracies in the spectrum, and it is uh, easy to destroy these degeneracies by introducing different effects, such as spin orbit coupling, uh, to induce topological phases. So this is one of the main requirements. It is not possible, for example, to make a topological insulator with usual square lattice. So one has to have a lattice with specific symmetry. OK, so uh, as I mentioned, we consider quasi-conservative situation. So for the moment, uh, this is because uh, the very appearance of the edge states, it is not connected with the fact that you can have, uh, that you have considerable losses in the system. So in principle, you can assume that you have a cavity with a very high Q, Q factor, very low losses. And then for the moment, uh, one can neglect uh, uh, loss term in this equation. So we work in uh, uh, circular polarization basis. So these are two couplet gross Pitaevsky equations for spin positive and spin negative uh, polariton wave functions. The first term is the usual term describing dispersion. This is the very specific term, which is uh, responsible for transverse electric, transverse magnetic, uh, uh, which describes EATM splitting, uh, and the form of this term is formally uh, analogous to, uh, similar to the term describing spin orbit coupling, for example, in Bose-Einstein condensate. There is, however, one important difference here that in Bose-Einstein condensate, you don't have these two in this term. Uh, this means that, for example, if you excite in Bose Einstein condensate with uh, one component with, uh, uh, let's say, plane wave, uh, then you get vortex with topological charge one in other component. Here in polariton condensate, you will get a vortex with topological charge two in other component. So the physics a little bit, is a little bit different. Uh, okay, so this term stands for the potential energy landscape in the microcavity. This, it basically describes this uh, honeycomb structure. Uh, this term uh, describes external magnetic field. So this is Zeeman splitting in the external magnetic field. And we take into account also uh, polariton polariton interactions. And they are very well known to be uh, repulsive for the components with the same spin and weakly attractive with this uh, small negative coefficient for components with, <coughs> sorry, with uh, opposite spin. Uh, let me uh, describe characteristic numbers. Uh, this is the, <coughs> uh, the structure with uh, separation between different pillars of about 2.5 microns. 
the size of the pillar is more or less the same, also 2.5 microns. And this is the typical numbers for potential energy uh, for depths of uh, individual wells, <clears throat> uh, for Zeeman splitting, and for spin orbit, uh, for energy of spin orbit coupling. <coughs> Uh, let me describe how one can find uh, uh, topological edge states in this system. Let us for the moment skip all non all nonlinear terms. So we just omit this term in the equation. And then this is linear equation in uh, periodic potential. Uh, so you can search for solution in the form of block waves, which are periodic in the y direction. So this function is uh, uh, periodic with the periodicity of the array. And it is localized uh, in x direction because our array is truncated. So we look for a function which is periodic in this direction and localize it in, uh, in uh, x direction. <clears throat> if uh, we don't have uh, in orbit coupling in the system, and we have only uh, external magnetic field, then uh, we can get the following dependence of the energy of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using here optical terminology. So uh, with uh, sine plus here, normally it should be minus. Uh, so somehow the picture is inverted uh, to, to the picture that you, uh, that you uh, get used to. Uh, so this is the dependence of energy on uh, block momentum. Uh, in this dependence, you see uh, two groups of bands which are mutually shifted. This shift is just two omega. So it, it's just given by the external magnetic field. Uh, in this structure, uh, black lines uh, correspond to bulk modes. So these are modes which are localized in the depth of the structure. These points are remnants of Dirac points in the spectrum of uh, two-dimensional uh, honeycomb lattice. Uh, so basically, this, this, this uh, dispersion relation is called projected dispersion relation because we have only one good uh, number k, uh, not kx and ky, because we truncated the structure. So we somehow have a projection, one-dimensional projection of the band structure. Uh, you can see that between Dirac points for uh, two uh, edge states appear, which are practically degenerate. So there are two edge states in this gap. Uh, well, this is not really gap. Uh, and two, uh, it's, in, let's say, it's not complete gap. So it's, it's actually closed. Uh, but at certain value of k, you still have uh, the gap. And two edge states uh, here. These guys are non-topological. So uh, they are localized at uh, uh, different edges, but uh, they do not move. So they have practically zero velocity. Uh, the group velocity uh, is just a derivative of energy with respect to momentum k. So they have practically zero group velocity and they are degenerate. Uh, let us now see what happens if you introduce spin orbit coupling in the system in addition, in addition to Zeeman splitting. This leads to opening of the topological gap. You see that, that there is a gap now, uh, actually two of them here and here. Uh, and uh, spin orbit coupling lifts the degeneracy of uh, two edge states. So now they acquire opposite slopes. Uh, and in addition, as I mentioned, they reside at different edges. So the edge state corresponding to red line resides on the left edge of the structure and it moves with, uh, let's say, negative velocity. This corresponds to positive direction of y axis while green state resides on the right edge and it moves in the opposite direction. So this is um, celebrated uh, unidirectionality of uh, edge states, uh, which is typical for systems with broken time reversal symmetry. Indeed, 
if we return to this equation, uh, uh, it can be shown that uh, if you simultaneously have uh, spin orbit coupling and Zeeman splitting in the equation, uh, you cannot uh, return to this. Uh, you cannot transform this equation to the to the previous form if you uh, uh, do standard time inversion. So if you switch components, change the sign of sign of time and uh, do complex conjugation. So you will not return to the previous system. This means that time reversal symmetry is broken and its manifestation is exactly in appearance of uh, these uh, edge states that move in a different direction. Okay, so this, uh, uh, this uh, dependence uh, is just the same thing, but for larger amplitude of spin orbit coupling. So one can see that topological gaps become wider. Uh, uh, yeah, so and uh, the velocity of corresponding edge states increases because the, the derivatives uh, of epsilon with respect to k grows when, when you increase uh, the strength of spin orbit coupling. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me show you how these uh, edge states look like. So these are two different structures with different truncation. This is structure with zigzag zigzag boundaries, and this is structure with bearded beyond bearded boundaries. There is also another type of truncation that leads to armchair boundary, but it doesn't support uh, edge states. So these are profiles of edge states from the uh, red branch, from uh, this branch, uh, for different values of block momentum. And you can see that uh, the localization of the edge state strongly depends on the value of momentum. So if you take the value of momentum close to, uh, let's say, uh, top edge, uh, that, that if you take the value of momentum close to this point, then you approach bulk band and your edge state uh, gradually gets uh, delocalized. So it fuses with the bulk band and transforms gradually into the bulk mode. Then the best localization you can see uh, in the middle of the gap, when the energy is in the middle of the gap. And then uh, you, when, you, when you increase K, you again obtain uh, delocalization because you will approach this band. Uh, okay, so one can see that, for example, uh, edge states at the opposite edges corresponding to, let's say, mirror symmetric values of momentum, they are just uh, mirror images of each other. But there is one important difference between them. They travel in different directions. So this guy propagates upwards and this guy propagates uh, uh, in the downward direction. And the same uh, absolutely the same physics is observed for other type of truncation. Okay, so this is purely linear, a purely linear system. Now we are interested in uh, what happens if you if we add nonlinearity into system. So we put back this uh, nonlinear term, and we now search for nonlinear generalizations of these block waves uh that uh, describe um, let's say now nonlinear eigenstates of the system uh so their profiles can be found from this equation and these are examples of corresponding uh nonlinear edge states uh so they are parameterized by the by their own energy mu uh they bifurcate from the linear edge state and with increase of their amplitude, uh, they gradually move in the spectrum uh, until uh, they reach the border of the topological gap. Let me show this in the, in the spectrum. So for example, we bifurcate from this point, we increase peak amplitude of the wave, and then we gradually move toward the uh, edge of, uh, of the gap. When we approach the edge of the gap uh, due to nonlinearity, uh, the state uh, becomes delocalized. 
and we uh, can see this here. So the, uh, there appears uh, non-zero background in the whole structure. Because these states are nonlinear, uh, they may experience instability. Yeah? Because uh, linear system is a linear system, so what you launch it lives there forever. But in the case of nonlinear system, you can have uh, development of instability. And it is natural in this case to assume that this instability will develop in the direction in which this wave is periodic. Uh, so we took this very uh, extended uh, nonlinear edge state, we perturb it with uh, some uh, small perturbation with, with the, let's say, cosine profile in the y direction, and we see that upon propagation, it uh, the instability devel develops. Uh, some modulation appears on top of the wave and of the wave and initially it breaks into sets of some uh, bright uh, objects with of course some radiation into the uh, into the bulk of the structure because this is nonlinear situation so you can even evaluate uh, the perturbation growth rate uh, for uh, such perturbation. So uh, this is the perturbation growth rate as a function of uh, frequency of perturbation of this direction. And there is a traditional uh, modulation instability band. So all perturbations within this uh, range uh, lead to decay of the state. But uh, higher, uh, higher frequency perturbations, they cannot lead to breakup of, uh, of the nonlinear edge state. Okay, but for us, the most interesting thing is that the wave uh, breaks into sets of uh, bright spots. This is the indication in, uh, in uh, soliton physics that you can have uh, solitons. Uh, and these are specific type of soliton because it is a uh, soliton of uh, mixed uh, origin. So uh, it is supposed to be localized in this direction across the interface due to uh, because it is a topological entity, so it feels the topological uh, structure of the material. But in this direction, along the interface, it will be localized due to nonlinear self-action, uh, due to balance between dispersion and nonlinear self-action. Okay, so we developed the theory describing such uh, the uh, envelopes of such solitons. We just uh, express them in this form. This A is just an envelope which is superposed on the block wave uh, along the y axis to make it localize it. And then after some algebra, you can derive the following equation for the envelope. So here, the first term, which is proportional to uh, epsilon prime, uh, describes uh, group velocity. Uh, uh, describes the fact that uh, the soliton will will move with non-zero uh, group velocity, uh, and this group velocity is given exactly by the first derivative of the uh, energy of the edge state with respect to Bloch momentum. Then there is a second term that describes group velocity dispersion. There are more terms, but we kept only two of them, uh, which are, let's say, largest. And there is a nonlinear term, uh, which in this case uh, corresponds to repulsive nonlinearity. This is just a effective uh, nonlinear coefficient. So this is very well known, uh, one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. And it is known that it uh, supports soliton solutions, provided that uh, the sign of this coefficient, g and epsilon uh, two primes, uh, is the same. So we can take a linear dispersion relation uh, for edge state, calculate the corresponding group velocity dispersion. For example, this is dispersion for uh, red edge state that resides on the left uh, edge of the uh, topological insulator. Uh, so you can see that there is a big region where um, uh, you can have a positive uh, epsilon to prime. So you can have bright solitons here in this region. This point is very specific. In this point, dispersion goes to zero. This means that uh, uh, if you launch something with corresponding momentum at the edge of the insulator, 
even if it has uh, unusual shape, it will remain uh, localized in the course of evolution. So the dispersion is uh, practically absent in this point. And then the broadening of corresponding wave packet will be described by next terms in these equations, which we omitted by sort order dispersion and etc. Okay, so here is the example of bright soliton, which is constructed using this approach. So we just took a block wave, superimposed a localized envelope on it, <coughs> sorry, uh, calculated from envelope equation, and then we allowed it to propagate. And then you see the formation of a localized object which moves along the edge of insulator over uh, very long times. This is comp comparison of um, peak amplitude in nonlinear region and in linear region. So in linear region, everything, if we switch off nonlinearity, everything just broadens on the same uh, uh, at the same uh, time. Yeah. But in uh, nonlinear region, we uh, the, the state really maintains uh, the localization. What is interesting is that this state also inherits topological protection. So if you put a defect on the edge of the structure in the form of a missing pillar, uh, you will see that uh, soliton will go across this uh, defect without, uh, it will not be uh, backscattered. Of course, there is some radiation because this is not linear system, so you cannot avoid it in principle, but uh, there is still absence of uh, backscattering. Okay, so and this object uh, can actually travel along uh, across the border of uh, the structure. So we started from here, and then we see that this state circulates along the border and practically returns to the initial location after sufficiently long time. Of course, there is radiation, especially when this guy moves to the armchair edge, because on this edge, it actually doesn't support edge states. Uh, so you have radiation when you enter this, uh, uh, this part of the structure. So we try to make it short. OK, so that was uh, uh, the part about solitons in uh, honeycomb structure. But it is very well known that uh, there are other types of uh, arrays that uh, support uh, specific degeneracies in the spectrum. And the most celebrated one is uh, leaf uh, array. So there are experiments on uh, leaf structures in polariton insulators. For example, in this work, uh, uh, experimentalists fabricated uh, so-called stub lattice. It's uh, like one dimensional generalization of uh, leaf structure. This work deals with a fully two dimensional leaf structure and uh, in nonlinear optics, you can also write a similar type of structures using, uh, uh, let's say, focused laser beams in the in uh, uh, transparent dielectrics. So what we basically change in uh, comparison with previous model is just the potential energy landscape, and we consider these two type of uh, structures. This is a standard Lie lattice, and this is a dislocated Lie lattice. So we will be interested in uh, dislocated one. This is a uh, band structure for dislocated Lie lattice. You now can see that uh, the uh, energy spectrum is somewhat different. So main difference is that now, because uh, there are three elements in the unit cell of the Lie lattice, you have uh, three bands in uh, let's say lowest uh, groups uh, group of bands. Uh, and when you introduce uh, Zeeman splitting and spin orbit coupling, this band uh, the, you, uh, you simultaneously observe appearance opening of uh, two topological gaps, one here and one here with different states in uh, different edge states and different gaps. Okay, these are examples of uh, edge states in uh, dislocated Lie lattice. And this is the slide showing how topological properties actually build up with increase of uh, strength of spin orbit coupling. So when there is no spin orbit coupling, you have purely, you have degenerate case. 
So the edge states appear at the two borders uh, of the structure. They, uh, they practically do not move. When you increase uh, spin orbit Kaufman, you see that uh, the symmetry is broken. So the uh, edge state, uh, for example, if we move uh, on a given uh, branch of dispersion relation, uh, corresponding edge state becomes localized at one edge only, and its localization increases with increase of the strength of spin orbit Kaufman. Okay. So then we uh, uh, did the same uh, thing as with honeycomb lattice. We found nonlinear edge states in this structure. So we basically bifurcated from uh, this edge state and then moved under the action of nonlinearity. Uh, I would like to mention that here we switch to conventional notations for, uh, uh, let's say, for polariton uh, systems. So now we have minus I uh, mu. Uh, T or minus I uh, epsilon T. Uh, so this is more familiar structure. And then this means that when we switch on the linearity, we move, uh, we have this blue shift. Yeah? So uh, this is example of nonlinear edge state in uh, Lieb lattice. And it turned it out that uh, in this structure, uh, edge states are remarkably robust. So even if you uh, impose periodic modulations, uh, or some noise on the state in this uh, y direction, it does not lead to breakup of this state up to very large times. So modulation instabilities for us, these states are strongly suppressed. Uh, and this allows, in principle, to nest dark solitons in such edge states, because one of the requirements for observation of dark solitons is that background on which such soliton resides should be modulationally stable. This is what we did. So we derived uh, the same type of equation. Now the sign of this term has changed because we changed the, uh, uh, the sign for epsilon. Uh, and this is the example of propagation of dark soliton nested in the extended edge state. So you see that this soliton maintains its uh, shape when it uh, travels along the structure. So it moves in the positive direction of y axis. And then it even reappears from other side because we use uh, periodic boundary condition. So if you now switch off nonlinearity, you will see considerable broadening of this dark notch. So it is indeed supported by nonlinear effects. And then you can compare the widths of the uh, dark notch in a nonlinear medium and linear one. And you see that in linear, it, it increases considerably. Okay. So this was uh, idealized situation without any losses in the model, uh, which is actually hard to meet in uh, real uh, polaritonic system. So then we made the next step. We considered, we introduced linear uh, uh, losses into our model. And we consider coherent pump, which can be non-uniform. So first of all, we can pump in other in different components in spin positive and spin negative one. And uh, we consider pump with certain frequency and with certain momentum k. So let us consider typical dispersion relation, linear dispersion relation for uh, uh, this uh, polaritonic structure in the presence of Zeeman splitting and spin orbit coupling. So we have these edge states sitting at different edges. Imagine now that we start pumping the system at certain value of momentum k. So it is very well known that pump, uh, let's say, imposes on uh, the excitation, the phase structure uh, that it has. So we select by selecting momentum k here, we select the particular edge states that will be excited. So for example, we can pump and the momentum equal to 0 0.6, for example. Then when we change uh, the frequency of our excitation, we will scan through this entire structure. And it's like, uh, it's like um, force it, uh, it's like oscillations in, uh, uh, let's say, force-set oscillator in the presence of the external force. When you hit uh, the eigenstates of the system, you have resonance with these eigenstates. So you effectively excite it. 
And this is indeed what we observed. So uh, I show here only uh, uh, the interval of energies corresponding to topological gap. So only, only this, this interval. So we scan in epsilon and we gradually increase the amplitude of uh, the coherent pump. And we consider here the symmetric case. So uh, amplitude of pump in spin positive component is equal to the amplitude of pump in spin negative component. So we scan in, we, if the amplitude is small, when we are at resonance with the edge state, we have a, a, a peak in this dependence, which means that we have resonance and we effectively excite this edge state. If we increase pump amplitude, uh, we have uh, nonlinear uh, uh, the tilt of resonances, which is uh, due to nonlinearity of the seed states. So uh, we have this uh, inclination and it may become at one point of time large enough uh, it may become even comparable with the width of the topological gap. This is not really good because in this case, you move with nonlinearity your state out of the topological gap and it becomes delocalized. So uh, this is classical uh, bistability. So you can see that uh, two states in principle uh, may be uh, stable at the same time. So this intermediate branch, it is always unstable. But you can realize situation when you can have a stable state on the upper branch and stable state on this uh, lower branch. So how do they look like? Uh, if you see, if you, if you consider different points, so here you have something delocalize it. Uh, then when uh, uh, we move along uh, toward the tip of the resonance, we have uh, uh, excitation of very well localized edge state sitting at the particular boundary because this is the resonance corresponding to uh, energy of uh, state on the left boundary. And then we again have delocalization when we move to the lower branch. Uh, it is interesting that for this particular set of parameters, uh, the other state sitting on the opposite branch of the, on the, on the opposite side of topological insulator, it is not excited. So uh, to excite it, one has to play with uh, polarization of the of the pump. This is what we did here. So we consider a different situation when we pump only in spin positive component or only in spin negative component. And these plots uh, correspond to different momenta of, uh, of the pump, uh, red curve corresponds to the amplitude of the edge state on the left boundary and green curve correspond to the amplitude of the state on the right boundary. Uh, and you can see that uh, you have uh, many opportunities. So you can excite either uh, by changing only the polarization of the pump and momentum. You can excite uh, states uh, either sitting on one boundary or on other boundary, or you can even have such exotic situation when two states are simultaneously excited at uh, opposite stages of the opposite edges of the insulator. So, and uh, importantly, these guys, they propagate in, uh, in opposite direction. So this is very unconventional uh, situation. Uh, okay, then we studied stability of uh, these states. And it turned out that uh, this uh, system with coherent pump, it can provide uh, the first example of really stable topological nonlinear edge state. And this is example of propagation of such states. So uh, due to uh, losses, due to interplay between losses, nonlinearity and the pump, you eliminate uh, all instabilities in the system. If you take, uh, uh, the situation corresponding to stable state, and then you put the defect in the structure, you will see that the wave will just flow around this defect and it will not be destroyed. So this is the illustration of the topological protection of, of the wave. Okay, that was uh, uh, infinite structure, but uh, 
uh, which was periodic in y direction, but you can actually consider finite configurations, uh, which are easier for experimental implementation. So these are like honeycomb arrays with different numbers of uh, comps, let's say comps along uh, the side of array. So here we have two, here we have three, here we have five, and here seven, I think. Uh, and you can see how topological properties of the system builds, uh, build, build up with uh, increase of the dimensionality of the system. This is just a linear spectrum of the system. So these dots, they correspond to different uh, modes of linear modes of this structure. And uh, so all, all modes sitting within topological gaps are formally edge states. And these modes are bulk modes. So they are concentrated uh, in the depths of this structure. And if you apply uh, just uniform pump, uh, then uh, uh, you will excite most efficiently one, only one of, uh, typically only one of those states. The, and uh, these states are shown with red dots. Uh, so the excitation efficiency is just defined trivially by the overlap integral between the profile of the modes and the pump profile. So when this quantity is largest, you have largest excitation efficiency. And this is a typical result of scan in uh, frequency of uh, uh, pump. Uh, you will see that, uh, for example, in this, uh, let's say, small structure, you excite most efficiently this state and this uh, a peak corresponds to excitation of this mode. So at the tip uh, of the this peak, so it is uh, it is really an edge state. And when you move away uh, from the peak, you see that uh, the contribution from bulk state gradually increases. And the same for larger structures. So here, just the uh, the corresponding resonance curve will just become more and more complicated uh, as you increase the size of the structure because you can simultaneously excite different topological modes. Okay, uh, let me now proceed to the fourth part of the talk. This is a topological laser. Uh, why topological lasers are so popular? Uh, so there exist many papers uh, claiming that uh, um, these lasers are uh, resistant to disorder, they inherit uh, topological protections of edge state. Why this happens? Uh, this is possible because uh, topological edge states are localized at the border of the structure, while by bulk modes they are extended over entire structure. So imagine that you pump only along the edge of the insulator. This means that the overlap of this pump with the topological edge state will be maximum, maximal, and the overlap with bulk modes will be just minimal. So it is just apparent that uh, bulk modes uh, will remain dumped, so they will still be lossy, while uh, the situation is possible when topological mode will be amplified. And then, uh, if you amplify only topological mode, you have lazing, lazing in this mode. Even if you introduce defects into structure, this lazing cannot be destroyed. And then if you have a mechanism that, uh, let's say, limits the amplitude of the lazing mode, you have a let's say, stable laser which operates in a linear edge. So how to realize this on this platform? Uh, one has to include uh, linear losses. Uh, this term is responsible for spatially localized uh, gain in this case for pump, or I don't know, let's call it coherent, spatially localized coherent pump. So the actual profile is given by, is, is shown here. It's just pump on uh, each uh, micro resonator along the edge. And uh, to make the thing stable, we need to introduce some mechanism that limits amplification. So we need to introduce nonlinear losses. Uh, in principle, one can do this by uh, simple, 
elimination of rate equation for reservoir. Uh, in principle, this alpha should also depend on uh, x and y coordinates, but for simplicity, one can set it uh, uniform. Okay, so let's consider, uh, let's for the moment skip nonlinear terms and consider linear spectrum of this system, but it is now dissipative system. So we have this uh, dissipative term. Uh, so these plots, they show uh, energy of uh, the edge state on a specific uh, plane. This is block momentum. Uh, this is the real part of the energy of uh, edge state. And this is minus imaginary part of the energy of the edge state. So basically, if you look at this plane, you will see uh, the typical uh, structure that I have shown on previous slides for, con for conservative system. When you add uh, gain into system at the surface, uh, if it exceeds certain critical level, you will see uh, amplification of some of the modes. So this amplification here is shown by uh, this minus uh, epsilon uh, imaginary uh, part. Uh, why minus? Because uh, the states with negative uh, epsilon imaginary will be amplified and the states with positive uh, uh, quantity will be, uh, will be dumped. So this is just for uh, uh, for visual uh, for the ease of visual uh, representation. So very close to threshold for lasing, uh, uh, one can see that only uh, a small portion of uh, the edge states in the vicinity of uh, momentum equal to 0 0.5 are uh, get amplified. So this is shown by this, uh, let's say, a small hub. Yeah? When you increase gain in your system, the region of uh, block states that will be effectively amplified gradually increases. And the uh, effective gain that they receive increases as well. So sooner or later, when, if you increase gain in your system, you will uh, make even bulk states lazy. Uh, so the question is, which state will win? Uh, because you have simultaneously amplification of several edge states. This is just unavoidable. So there is a finite uh, band. Uh, it's like a parabola that you just leap uh, up. Um, so this point uh, on this plot, it's just a maximum of this dependence. Uh, so when it crosses zero, you have you transfer from the region with decay into lazy region. Uh, and then you have a competition between different modes. And the question is, which one will win? Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, close uh, to uh, threshold, only one mode wins the competition. So if you propagate, uh, you will see uh, that close to the threshold, you will have uh, excitation of a stable nonlinear edge state. And this is the dependence of uh, uh, peak amplitude of this edge state on gain amplitude. This is dependence of the energy of the state on uh, gain amplitude. So uh, we again move from uh, 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 energy corresponding to linear edge state because we bifurcate from uh, linear edge state. And then uh, under the action of nonlinearity, uh, this is again optical notation. Uh, the energy will uh, decrease until we reach the border of the gap. So the amplitude just increases monotonically with increase of uh, gain amplitude. But sooner or later, you cannot do this indefinitely. Sooner or later, when the gain amplitude becomes uh, sufficiently large, uh, you will enter, you will make uh, your state unstable. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so you will see this uh, uh, radiation into bulk, uh, some irregular splitting. Uh, to be honest, uh, most of experiments on uh, topological lasing, in my view, are performed in the, actually in this region. So they always see, uh, even so, they claim that. Uh, 
there is a uniform, uh, there is a considerable uniformity along the edge of the insulator. Still, you can always see some uh, oscillations. This means that uh, actually you have competition between several modes and there are some beatings between them. Uh, so one has to consider this uh, statement about uh, single mode lasing in topological insulators with, uh, with care, let's say. Okay, so uh, this system uh, inherits topological protection. So even if you put uh, a defect, uh, you will excite the state that is, uh, let's say, that goes around this defect and still remains localized at the edge. Uh, and this is for topologically non-trivial system, and this is the effect of removal of one pillar uh, in the case of topologically trivial system. So you see that uh, the uh, it produces much larger deformation. Uh, around the uh, around the uh, uh, removed uh, pillar. Okay, so uh, this stability is only possible close to lazing threshold when you really have uh, when one mode really can win the competition. Uh, so for larger amplitude, you have this instability. So how to get rid of these instabilities? One can put this uh, into localize it. Uh, uh, one can make uh, the structure localize it. When you make a structure localize it, you effectively remove uh, instabilities uh, associated with very small uh, frequencies, with very small modulation frequencies that are most destructive. So if the size of the structure is uh, smaller than certain limit, then you just uh, eliminate these instabilities. And if you start with the excitation on just one edge of the structure, this is the gain profile. This is the potential energy landscape. We start from excitation on this edge. Then uh, because this is the system with broken time reversal symmetry, the excitation travels along the edge. And sooner or later, uh, you get uh, lasing uh, exactly along the edge of the topological insulator. So, so the, the entire H starts lazing, and this is essentially stable regime. So you, uh, uh, the, the state will persist forever. Okay, and this is the final part of my talk. Uh, I will be very brief here. So uh, people are, uh, so one of the advantages of uh, topological insulators, uh, of edge states and topological insulators is their topological protection. What does this mean? If you have topologically protected edge state, then if you introduce a defect in the structure, uh, there is no backscattering, uh, there is no radiation into bulk. So even if you have uh, defects in the structure, you cannot couple states that uh, reside at the opposite edge, uh, that, that reside at the opposite state edges of the insulator by introducing uh, perturbations, localized perturbations into structure. Of course, you can couple them if you do global deformation of the band structure, but with localized perturbations, you cannot uh, couple uh, states at the opposite edges. So the question arises if there are any mechanism that would allow uh, coupling between edge states that propagate in opposite directions and reside at the opposite edges of the insulator. And it turns out that this mechanism uh, exists uh, such a coupling can be uh, simulated by time modulation of the underlying potential uh, energy landscape. So let us consider the band structure for topological insulator. Here we change uh, the width of the structure in this direction. Uh, and we show that uh, two edge states always persist. So they just practically do not change. What changes is the density of uh, states in the bulk. Uh, then if we select the modulation frequency omega such that it is equal to energy difference between these two states, so this frequency can be rather small so that this modulation becomes, uh, let's say, uh, relatively slow. Uh, then uh, you will observe the following picture. So you will start 
uh, we can start from the edge state sitting on the right boundary. This is just two components, plus and minus components. Let's look at the minus component. We start from the state sitting on the right boundary, and then we uh, modulate at the frequency corresponding to the difference between the two edge states. Uh, and you see that with time, energy, uh, the density uh, flows from this edge to this edge. So at one point of time, you end up with uh, uh, excitation sitting on the left edge of the structure. But this process is actually periodic. So after that, the, after we get localization on this edge, the reverse process starts. And then uh, we, uh, after one period, we recover the excitation sitting again on the right edge of the structure. Uh, so this process can be actually explained using couplet mode theory. Uh, it is valid uh, as long as uh, the separation, as, as long as energies of edge states are well separated from energies of bulk mode, then you write the field in the form of superposition of uh, edge states sitting on the right edge and left edge with corresponding energies. And you will end up with the couplet mode equations for their amplitudes. And these couplet mode equations, they just describe periodic energy exchange between corresponding modes. Uh, so this process is rather slow. So these small oscillations on top of this dependence, they correspond to period of modulation of the potentials. Uh, so you modulate the, the, the frequency of modulation of potential is much larger than the frequency of switching. Uh, this picture corresponds to resonance. So if the modulation frequency exactly corresponds to the difference of energies, then you get a complete switching. But if you move outside of resonance, then you get incomplete uh, switching and also switching time uh, decreases. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is just interesting observation that uh, the efficiency of this process is characterized by the coupling constant. This coupling constant, it enters into couplet mode equations and it is given by overlap integral between uh, 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 the potential energy landscape and uh, profiles of modes sitting at the opposite edges. And it turns out that, for example, for certain momentum, you can have a negligible coupling. This means that you cannot couple waves uh, with momentum, I don't know, 0.57 or something. Of course, uh, the efficiency of this process, uh, uh, it, this process is efficient only if you have narrow structure, because you have to have considerable overlap between modes sitting on the left on the, and right edge. And this overlap increases if you increase the size of the insulator. So this is just a switching time as a function of number of uh, combs in the ins insulator, and it increases uh, just dramatically. Okay. So, and this is just a resonant dependence. Uh, this is a switching time. Uh, and it, the plot for switching efficiency is the same as a function of uh, detuning from resonant frequency. So this is a resonant process with uh, a maximum corresponding exactly to the difference of energies of uh, two edge states. And when you put on linearity into this system, you can actually tune this resonance curve. This is a linear curve. And in the presence of nonlinearity, it becomes uh, strongly nonlinear. So it, it shifts the position of resonance uh, may shift uh, on uh, on the left side. So thank you very much for your attention. I will not read these conclusions because this is basically the, the same thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really, a lot of material, very interesting physics. So I'm sure there will be lots of questions. I have three pages of questions. Myself. So before I start, I will open uh, the presentation, the paper to those who are attending. So do you have any questions, guys? Yeah, I have some questions. Okay. So I see Sergey and Helgi have questions. Helgi, let's start with you. Okay. So thanks a lot for the talk. It's uh, really interesting 
really interesting, interesting uh, science, which I remember reading about two years ago. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about. So in order to get lacing in your edge states, you have to pump explicitly the edge, right? You have to introduce gain at the edge. Yes. Um, so what is the, so does this mean that as you uh, as your gain region goes more and more into the bulk, the whole lattice starts lacing? There is no way to get, there is no way to move the edge state into the gain bandwidth, even though you're pumping the entire system. There is no, is, there, is this not possible? Uh, let's say if you pump exactly at the edge, uh, the edge state will always experience largest uh, gain. Uh, right. When you increase gain amplitude, uh, then even because we have background losses, right? So we have these background losses, and everything is determined by the interplay between uh, this guy and this guy. Yeah? So because this is partially inhomogeneous. Uh, then uh, you just can calculate the overlap integral for different states uh, with the gain landscape. So the efficiency of amplification is also determined by this overlap integral. Of course, it is largest for, uh, for edge states. So you just always have maximum here. Yeah? So when you increase it more and more, it just penetrates into bulk. Uh, and then you have lazing with bulk mode. If you start pumping somewhere in the bulk, then of course uh, your maximum will appear somewhere here. So okay, so uh, okay, so it's just determined by uh, overlap integrals of the yes, it's a trivial the, overlap the integral. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Be um, maybe, because you have this. Maybe, you have this. So you have the situation also if you have open boundary conditions, then uh, you also have to take into account losses in the system away from the uh, away from the lattice, right? You have uh, if you have open boundary conditions, then your um, then you have basically leakage. You have energy radiation away from your lattice. So this is an additional yeah. loss mechanism. That could have yeah, in principle, we consider it uniform losses, right? So in this case, losses are uniform, so they are present everywhere. Okay. This term so, is just uniform. But of course, you can introduce other loss mechanisms. But I think that it will just contribute to magnitude of gamma. Okay. So, uh, and then, then uh, okay, because this is, it, this, is a, this is a topological polarity laser. So if you're introducing gain, you're using some non-resonant excitation to introduce the gain at the edge. Uh, mm -hmm. This will, will this not at the same time also detune your uh, pillars at the edge, away from the bulk, because there will be additional blue shifts. Yes, that that is true, uh, uh, and this is the effect that we don't consider here. Uh, yeah, formally you change also real part of uh, uh, of, of this uh, R function, so you also change potential energy landscape. Yeah, okay. it's a kind of defect. Uh, okay. Uh, so in here, everything is determined by the interplay of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the correction induced by the reservoir and uh, the depths of the uh, pillars. So which, which one will win? I think that pillars are, uh, I think that physically probably the, uh, uh, this, uh, Correction induced by the reservoir will be smaller than the depth of the of the uh, created by the pillar. But uh, one has to really look at the the business in the particular full uh, model that accounts for reservoir. Um, so I, I don't quite understand. So the depth of the pillar. Um, uh, <clears throat> So when we, so this uh, R function, mm -hmm. well, that's of the potential, uh, well, not of the pillar, sorry. <laughs> so this R function models uh, the potential energy landscape, which is created by uh, these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had estimate somewhere. 
uh, on one of the first slides. You had 700 micro EV, the depth yes. of the pillar. Yes, the potential I depth. I never estimated. So how how large is this in comparison with uh, with uh, impact of uh, repulsive potential, which is induced by uh, reservoir? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So but I, much I, larger, I, yes. Yeah, but but I, I don't quite understand why the depth of the pillars uh, is, uh, is is the thing of. We should be looking at here because you you can make the pillars like infinite um, infinite quantum wells, and if you uh, then add the non-resonant pump in one well, then you will shift the potential landscape with respect to all the others in the bulk. So this is uh, so this is what I'm thinking. If you are pumping inside the well, then its whole potential floor rises, and it has nothing to do with uh, you know how big the well is because you can. Do the same thing for inf infinite uh, potential wells. But, oh, but then how? Maybe it, I can refer. Uh, they wouldn't couple. If if it is infinite yeah, potential well, that. there wouldn't be coupling. So none of these effects would be there. But maybe if I, I if I reformulate also for for the experimentalists in the group the question, if you go back to the slide where you have your triangular edge state. This one, yeah. Just a this second. One. There we are, yes. So uh, a question which would be of relevance to uh, a, a, you know, uh, an experiment would be the following. If you were to pump the whole triangle, so the gain, the green R imaginary, yes, now you are adding gain only on the edge. If you were to pump the whole big triangle, yeah, uniformly, under in, under which parameter space the gain in the edge state would be winning over the gain in the bulk so that you can still obtain your edge polariton laser, your edge state polariton laser? Yeah, good question. So one has to really calculate the spectrum and see where you will have. Uh, I don't think that in this case, uh, edge states will win. I don't think. Uh, most likely you will get lazing in the center, in the bulk states. Right. Because the immediate question that one can pose is the following. In order for you to introduce gain in the perimeter of your triangle, as you have done now in the green shaded image, mm -hmm. you are using uh, a laser, which is an edge state laser by itself. So you use a laser of the form of the laser that you want to obtain. Mm -hmm. So one would need to really understand what tolerance on the spatial width of the pumping laser can be accepted so that mm -hmm. you end up with a net state which is sharper than the one that you pump. Because if my pump is sharper, mm -hmm. yes, in K space or in real space, then the edge state that I create what is the point? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, you see what I mean. So, one the optical realization this pumping is usually electrical. So, let's say uh, they pump uh, through some electrodes connected to the edge of the structure, and then this is a different business. So, right. Okay. So, for electrical pumping conditions where you only pump the edges, that 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 would make sense. What you are talking about exactly. Okay. So, uh, Helgi. Yeah, I'm here. Can I follow up to your question. No, no, it's uh, it's it's clear now. It's clear now. I see. Um, I, uh, I I get I get your point. Okay, but uh, it would be. Oh, I would uh, I would like to understand what is the effect of this tuning when you add this gain region inside the pumps because mm -hmm. uh, because I mean, I'm 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 not sure if it uh, is negligible. Right, it should be something you know. Uh, it is not negligible for sure. So one has to really, uh, one has to really calculate uh, how, because this will also impact the spectrum of uh, uh, of the system. I mean, this um, it will impact the spectrum in this plane. Uh, 
So you will be effectively shifting, uh, detuning uh, the, edge, uh, the pillars at the edge. So uh, one has to make sure that edge states persist. So this will work, but up to a certain pump level. And maybe it can even be engineered the way if you uh, if you make the uh, if you lithographically engineer your system to have like uh, the edges already detuned away from the bulk, and then you add your gain, and then they they move into resonance with the rest of the bulk. So no, you probably. could like have two effects that cancel each other. Probably yes. Okay, so maybe Sergey, you had a question. Seth. We can hear you. No, we don't hear you now. You pressed something and we don't hear you anymore. Hear yeah, me now, like this. Now we hear you, yes. yes. So uh, in one of your slides, you uh, said that uh, different type of borders for uh, one of the lattices uh, mean uh, either supporting the edge state or not supporting. So mm -hmm. how can you, uh, what type of analysis you need to do, for example, look at the spectrum of the system uh, to, to say in advance that uh, for this system, you definitely can get these uh, edge states? Uh, well. Uh, this is unpredictable. You really have to. You really have to calculate. Uh, let me show. Ah, this was somewhere. Yeah, it it was here. Uh, for example, for honeycomb structure, uh, you have uh, edge states appearing here between these two points. Uh, so these are former Dirac points. If you truncate, if you make bearded bearded interface, then you have uh, complementary edge states that appear here outside of uh, this region. Yeah. If you truncate armchair sink, uh, so if you make a armchair edge, then you will have uh, actually very narrow region with. Uh, uh, one edge state connecting uh, these two bands, but it will never go from this band to this band. So it will be not of topolo not of topological origin. So you can have it, but it is not topological. But in each particular case, you really have to calculate for each particular location. Uh, so this uh, property, uh, it is just known from uh, solid state physics. So people uh, already know that armchair uh, edges are bad and the zigzag ones are good. Okay. Uh, and uh, I have a couple more questions, small questions. So uh, somewhere later in your presentation, you mentioned that mo most of the experiments performed in the regime where you have simultaneous uh, uh, edge mode propagating and some other competing modes which give you some emission. Yeah. And uh, uh, from your talk, as I understood, the beauty of this uh, system, uh, the topological and simulator, is that you can realize this, uh, this situation when only one edge uh, mode is amplified and it should be uh, resistant to any disorder and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the, what could be the reason of these other competing modes in the regime where you have uh, indeed this topological state and something more uh, present in the system? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me show the spectrum. So let's look at this uh, at this uh, panel A. Uh, you always have. Uh, so uh, you always have a certain band of uh, momenta mm -hmm. where you have uh, modes with uh, non-zero uh, imaginary part corresponding to growth. Yeah? So you have maximum at k equal to 0 0.5, but there are also other modes uh, uh, away from this point. And the width of this region in k where you get effective amplification increases as you increase uh, the pump amplitude. Yeah? 
So now imagine that you launch something into your system, which is uh, very different from any edge state in the system. Yeah? So you excite effectively the whole bunch of uh, these modes. Yeah? And then the competition between them starts in the process of evolution. And this competition, so if you would have a linear system, uh, you would always have beating between them. So they will be, uh, they would be there forever. Uh, uh, well, because, um, well, one of them will experience higher gain, of course, and it will eventually grow, but it would take very lar large time for this mode to, to let's say, uh, dominate. Yeah, but be, so the problem is that there are several modes that have uh, very close uh, growth, uh, growth rates that, very, uh, that have very, very similar, uh, let's say, effective amplification. So you can only you can only uh, get rid of this if you add nonlinearity into your system and you have the competition between these modes. So uh, in this in this case, you may hope that uh, very close to threshold when you have this situation, uh, only one mode will win. What happens when this mode wins? So its amplitude increases. Uh, it uh, so it. Uh, leads to uh, effective uh, losses, right? Because we have this uh, term with nonlinear losses. Uh, so these losses for other modes may become maybe such that they compensate uh, that they uh, uh, compensate effective gain for those modes. Uh, well, this is classical mode competition, and then these modes will just decay, and only one will win. Uh, well, people seen, uh, who work with topological lasers, for example, uh, first experiment on topological laser in science with uh, ha where this Halden model realized it, it's a discrete system. So they say that they have just one edge state with a very well separated energy. And then when they pump only this edge state crosses laser threshold. In reality, I think this is not true because uh, they work actually with discrete system, and this is artifact of discrete system. So when you look at continuous one, you always have this situation. Yeah. In reality, the picture is even more uh, difficult because uh, you have uh, temporal, uh, some temporal degrees of freedom, some, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, you cannot. You you should assume that uh, your amplification also depends on time. So you have to take into account that your laser responds somehow to uh, <clears throat> to uh, if you have rich dynamics, uh, and then uh, this leads to additional instabilities, and then you may show that actually. Uh, it, is, it becomes even harder to get something uh, stable, uh, to get stable lasers. Uh, if you introduce defects, if you introduce defects, uh, then uh, you, you, you make defects just in uh, one place of the structure. Yeah? So in uh, at one side, as I mentioned that, uh, unless you change the all uh, 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 potential energy landscape, you cannot change the topology of the system, which means that uh, such localized perturbations, they just cannot uh, change this uh, dispersion relation. So um, even if you have this defect, uh, this is the essence of topological protection. You, you, you cannot change the structure and then the lazy state persists. So it just will find a way around the defect. Thank you. And the uh, last uh, technical question uh, about the last part of your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, where you considered finite size uh, systems with uh, modulated in time potential. Uh, do you know it from the literature uh, any experimental observation supporting? Mm -hmm. No, unfortunately, no. This, this is the weakest part because if you look at this, uh, uh, so. Uh, we can estimate the, let's say, energy difference uh, between uh, edge states uh, and related to real numbers, but 
still this frequency of modulation, the period of this modulation, it may be will be 100 times more than the, or I don't know, 50 times more than lifetime of polariton. So I I am not I don't know, uh, and this is let's say hundreds of picoseconds. I don't I don't know uh, uh, which kind of uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't know which kind of uh, technique he can use to modulate uh, the system at this rate, because uh, the electrical, some electrical modulators or whatever they. Uh, I was looking in the literature, and uh, let's say I, I was able to find some modulators working at uh, the rates of uh, nanoseconds, not uh, hundreds of picoseconds. Let's say that that's uh, the main problem. So you either need an acoustic wave or something that uh, changes uh, very rapidly, yeah? so that uh, oscillates also with time, uh, but uh, it should oscillate in such a way that uh, the potential is modulated uh, harmonically. So, uh, but here, here, here we could actually suggest something which is uh, there is a there is a there is a, an easy way to go around the issue that you are discussing with acoustic or, or electro-optic modulators. You can have two single mode lasers that you detune exactly at the frequency that you want, and mm -hmm. they produce the beating that you want. So you can use two lasers with the right frequency detuning that mm -hmm. will give you the modulation that you want in a sinusoidal way. Okay, so excellent. it is possible to do that by beating I see. I see. Lot of lasers, yeah. So it, it is possible to address. But uh, Sergey, is there a follow up to your question? Uh, no, thank you very much. Thank you, Sergey. Any more questions? I'm trying to see everyone on the same screen. Uh, yes, I have a question. Can I ask? Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm actually. I was wondering if the if there are any uh, in the coherence in the coherence length of the uh, topological laser with respect to the conventional polariton laser. I think. Well, uh, we did not study here coherence aspects, so. We suppose that everything is coherent, so that you can introduce these wave functions, and uh, yeah. So we assume that uh, the field is coherent and it is extended. So it, uh, so over the entire periphery of the structure, we assume that it is coherent. But it's uh, well, it's very practical uh, uh, and experimentally oriented question, I would say. Uh, to demonstrate over which region the coherence can extend in this system. This I cannot really answer. Uh, yeah, I also was wondering if you try to put uh, some noise into the system to address this point somehow, no? Uh, noise into wave function or noise into, or disorder into potential? No, 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 no. Actually both, yeah. To, to the, yeah, actually both. Oh, so uh, a small disorder uh, does not affect the properties of topological states. So it's, it can be even time varying or it can be stationary. So it can be frozen. Yeah? So mm -hmm. at all times, if it is small and if it does not close the topological gap, then it cannot destroy edge states. They will just persist. Uh, and disorder in the wave function, it's uh, like, uh, this is like stability analysis that we did. So this is what we do when we study, for example, stability of these guys. So mm -hmm. we basically superimpose always a small scale random noise on this uh, state, and then it can lead to instability or it does not lead to instability. So depending on uh, whether wave is stable or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are the typical um, scale for the topological gap just to compare with the uh, typical disorder we can expect from the experiment? Typical scale of uh, what is the topological gap, yeah, which has to be uh, clear from, you know, filling due to the uh, disorder. Spatial scale, you mean? 
uh, the size of the structure and energy scale energy, energy. Scale. Ah, energies all energies are normalized to uh what is it that? Just a second. yeah so we just uh, normalize uh, all scales in this equation to uh, what is called uh, recoil energy in uh, physics of both the Einstein condensate. So you introduce the characteristic uh, transfer scale and then this gives you characteristic energy. I can say, I can tell that uh, it's of the order of uh, maybe 100 micro EV or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then all energies uh, have to be just rescaled in accordance with this value. All right. Okay. And uh, yeah, and uh, the very last question. It is a bit off topic. Uh, uh, is there any way to uh, create some sort of squeeze state uh, out of the um, topological physics you, you studied? I think people are doing this. Yeah, so they, they, uh, there is a paper in Optica about uh, this aspect. So they do this with topological insulators. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. but uh, I think it's a group of uh, Alex Zamite uh, who write these topological insulators in fused silica. Uh, this is Floquia insulators, and then they uh, they do investigate experimentally these aspects with. Uh, uh, this is, there are some experiments, you mean, yeah. Yes, there are some experiments. So it's published in Optica, as far as, far as I remember, uh, and the group is from uh, University of Rostock, this Alexander Zami, you, you can check. I just right. don't follow this direction. Okay, yes, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Any more questions? If not, I have a couple of questions uh, to ask you. Uh, we have a few more minutes before we close our two-hour session. So uh, my first question uh, was on the honeycomb lattice that you showed in the beginning, where mm -hmm. you demonstrated the regime where you uh, obtain uh, bright solitons, so these topological mm -hmm. quasi-solitons, as you as you call them. Yes, this guy. And exactly, yes. So. Uh, in, in this regime, uh, what is the parameter space that would allow you to go from bright solitons to dark solitons, as you discussed later on for the for the dislocated lead lattices? Are, mm -hmm. are there possible solutions of dark solitons in the honeycomb case? Yes, you just need to look at the dispersion. Mm -hmm. uh, when it is positive, in this case, you have bright solitons, and when it is negative, you have dark ones. So uh, you are right, with the same type of the lattice, you can have both bright and dark ones. Okay, and then when you went to the to the case of the dislocated uh, lib lattice, mm -hmm. then you what you showed was that uh, you have very robust, uh, it, the system is much more robust. Can you explain why the system is more robust in the case of the dislocated lib lattice with respect to the honeycomb lattice? This we don't know. This we don't know. It's just a dynamical property. So for some reasons, growth rates are suppressed. And this, this is only observed in one of the topological gaps. So for example, the states in this gap, they were, let's say, equally vulnerable to instabilities. They mm -hmm. featured the same uh, width of the modulation instability band as the states in uh, 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 honeycomb lattice. But uh, the guys from uh, this topological gap, which is narrower, and it was very surprising for us, uh, they were more robust. Uh, it's something connected with the symmetry of the lattice, but it's a purely nonlinear thing. So we, we, can, we don't have analytical explanation, let's say. Okay, thank you. Also on the, on the same topic here, on the dislocated lead lattices, uh, you have, uh, you saw some very, very nice uh, dark solitons forming. The way for it, what is the way for inducing these dark solitons? Is it again a modulation on the pump? How, do you, how did you obtain these dark solitons? 
Uh, it, this is con uh, idealized conservative system so far. So you have to take a, a edge state, which is infinite, and then nest into it uh, dark, dark soliton, which is this uh, uh, tanch uh, modulation. On so you put it by hand, do I understand well? Sorry? You induce it by hand, if you like, yes? Yes, 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 yes. We just superimpose this... Uh, Dunge profile on top of the edge state, of top of, on top of the linear edge state. I understand. Okay, I have uh, one uh, one more question, which comes to the to, to towards the end. We addressed most of my questions. So towards the end of your talk, where you are talking about of uh, the transformation of edge states to insulators, yes. So to mm -hmm. polarity on insulators, and one of the arguments there is that. Uh, if you have a defect, you will have no backscattering. Uh, yes, so the, the, your, 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 your state will go through the defect that you have induced there mm -hmm. without backscattering. Uh, I am, you know, we, we know that these uh, polariton condensates, if we are talking about polaritons, they are superfluids. So just by the nature of superfluidity, one would expect that when the flow meets a defect, there will be no back, there will be no scattering. So, can you explain what is the uh, what under which circumstances a superfluid would need this insulator state in order to avoid back scattering? Uh, well, you are talking about nonlinear regime because you are talking about superfluidic behavior, right? Yes, yes. So, which means that this is slow, uh, let's say, uh, low velocities, right? So, uh, and then you have breakup of superfluidity when velocity is large. Uh, this is pure linear business. So, uh, in this case, we don't need actually nonlinearity for the effect to occur. Yeah, you can actually skip all these nonlinear terms. Okay. Uh, the effect is, in essence, is uh, analogous uh, to the technique. Uh, probably you know it uh, when uh, people use long periodic grating in fibers to convert uh, uh, modes, uh, fundamental modes into, let's say, vortex modes or something different or dipole modes. Mm -hmm. The effect is essentially the same. So the physics of the effect, you just resonantly couple two levels. With them ah, sorry, no, I was not referring to these coupled uh, edge states. I was referring to the case where you create a defect. I think it is in the previous slide. Ah. Sorry, and one before. Yeah, oops, this one. In so this here, one. yes, here you create a defect, and yeah. you you show that uh, your this uh, topological laser, if you like, it does not scatter from this defect. But yes. uh, the, the, a polariton laser is a superfluid, so you wouldn't expect it to scatter. But what? You, so your answer is still the same that you're in the linear regime because I thought no, here no, you're no, in no, no. This is essentially nonlinear regime. Uh, our point here is that in the nonlinear regime you also have this absence of bug scattering, but uh, in topological insulator this resistance to bug scattering is uh, essentially of linear origin. Yeah. So let me let me explain this. Uh, let me show. Yeah. The, this is the band structure for topological insulator, right? So let's assume that we introduce a defect into structure. Uh, when we can backscatter. So this state resides on the right edge and this state resides on the left edge. If we introduce the defect, this means that we effectively uh, can scatter uh, this state into state with other K numbers. Yeah, but uh, scattering will occur in the state with the same energy. So we can only scatter on the state uh, in the state with the same energy. Uh, but if we look in this topological gap, we don't encounter any other state with the same energy that would sit at the same interface. Because this guy sits at the opposite interface somewhere very far, and you just cannot scatter into it. So you, uh, this is the explanation of the absence of backscattering. You just don't have states into which you can scatter. Uh, for the situation in the valley hole system is somewhat different. So if you look at this, uh, I had in the beginning, 
one slide for Wally whole system. This guy, yeah. The situation here is a different. You simultaneously have two edge states coexisting on one edge and they move in the opposite direction. So if you have localized defect in the system, uh, which means you, you have a spectrum of perturbation with uh, in a very broad range of K values, you can scatter from one state to other one. And on these reasons, people say that the Wally Hall system offers much weaker topological protection than the system with its broken time reversal symmetry. Because you always, on localized defect, you do see scattering in the opposite direction. So you, you have uh, edge state interacting with the defect, and then something always backscatters. And to avoid this, you have to use uh, defects which are very wide. Uh, which means that the spectrum of K values uh, for such defects is very narrow. So you just don't excite uh, the state with, uh, that propagates in the opposite direction. And this is the, precisely the reason why in this system, the guys consider it sharp corners because uh, the same problem also refers to corners in the Wally Hall system. The state can pass, uh, let's say, uh, sharp corners but it cannot pass 120 degrees corner. So <laughs> oh, it's a really a matter of uh, uh, coexistence of several uh, states at the same boundary. And that's why this is the reason that we can we consider systems with broken time reversal symmetry. They are uh, essentially robots in this sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So are there any more questions? Well, well, if not, I would like to thank you very much, Professor Kardashov. We should uh, actually, uh, if possible, I will contact you straight after this to arrange that we meet also in person. Uh, in 10 days, I will be in Moscow uh, so that we can really follow up on this discussion because there are a lot of interesting things. And there is a discussion that maybe we can have straight away uh, uh, regarding the potential for this kind of structures with the kind of optical lattices that in use, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, but this is an extended discussion that goes beyond okay. the, the, the seminar. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, Professor uh, Anatoly Kamchato for, for joining us today. Uh, and the talk will become available on our website very soon. So okay. thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.